In the distant future, in the year 2122, the crew of the mining vessel Nostromo are awoken early from cryostasis due to an intercepted signal they are obligated to investigate. What they find is a colossal crashed alien ship, the fossilized corpse of its pilot, and a bunch of strange eggs. A creature emerges from one of these eggs and latches on to a crew member, starting a chain of events that spawned one of the most beloved horror franchises in film history and effectively started the career of Oscar-nominated filmmaker Ridley Scott. On today's show, our topic is the 1979 horror classic, Alien. I'm Connor Izagari. And I'm Austin Johnson. And this is Filmgasm. Happy Wednesday, listeners. Welcome to the 74th episode of the Filmgasm podcast, recorded via Skype for the foreseeable future. Today's episode is a film that's been on our list since the beginning, and we thought, what better time to do a film that focuses on a parasitic organism that escapes an attempted quarantine and kills off a crew of blue-collar workers? Most of the films we cover going forward are going to be longtime favorites or meaty topics, stuff we have easy access to. Once the quarantine is lifted and things begin to return to normal, we'll resume our random picks and get back to the freaky underground shit. Regardless, if you're a horror fan, you're still going to enjoy the show. Yeah, no no laps in quality, just more familiar films. Yeah, and that's you know that's uh, probably a good thing, especially because people are going to be at home using these streaming services just like we will. So yeah. it's gonna be it's gonna be a good uh, yeah way to way to stir up a conversation because yeah, it's gonna be films like you said are more familiar. I agree. Yeah. Exactly. You can kind of watch along with the show if you want. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, no rewind today, which means we'll be discussing a bit about the films we've been watching lately. Due to being cooped up, we've both been watching a shit ton of movies. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Too many. <laughs> I'm like, if 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 I could be close to movied out, I'm close to it. <laughs> <laughs> no and, such thing. I can use but, some uh, good but, ones. <laughs> but I'm. I'm like, I, I want to overdose, so I'm going to keep going. <laughs> Very I nice. love it. I love it so much. Yeah, I've seen, I've watched a lot of cool shit, you know, and I think we both have. I think we've both been able to watch things we've never seen before or know nothing about. And that's the beauty of it, you know. That is nice. And uh, my goal this year is to knock, knock out my Netflix watch list. So I'm going just a film at a time, watching whatever Netflix throws at me. And uh, some of my recent films have been olympus has fallen which i really liked i'd seen that before but i didn't really give it the time of day i was kind of in and out this time i focused on it and i was like you know what this is pretty badass <laughs> uh same with cloverfield i watched that again for the uh, for the second time recently and i was pretty blown away this time when i saw it the first time i'd never seen a found footage film i was distracted by that i didn't know what the hell was going on i got motion sick because i saw it at the movies and uh, now I watched it again, and yeah, that's a fucking awesome movie, Cloverfield. Yeah, I, th- I think Cloverfield is a film that takes some experience. Uh, like you said, it was your first found footage, and you see it in theaters. So that shit can give you a headache, man. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I totally understand that. I think a lot of people would say that Cloverfield rewatch is like one of the more powerful. Oh shit, you know? Yeah. Uh, you you kind of have that revelation. Uh, yeah, man. I, I mean, there's there's so many things to watch. Uh, I've been watching things, you know, on Netflix and Criterion and Amazon. It's 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 a, it's a, an amazing time we're in. But the coolest thing I have watched would be um, the new Michael Jordan and my, uh, Chicago Bulls uh, documentary called The Last Dance, mm-hmm. which uh, pr- it premiered on Sunday, and they're doing two episodes every Sunday for five weeks. So it's ten episodes all together, uh, you know, made by ESPN and Netflix. Uh, a lot of people anticipate that Netflix will have all the episodes once it's said and done. But um, the first two released on Sunday, and they were breathtaking. Uh, the footage is unbelievable. It's following the 1997-1998 uh, season. That's Michael Jordan's last season with the Bulls. Uh, you know, obviously they won won their won the championship and his sixth championship with the team. And it's just uh, an amazing time for sports. And uh, you know, if you love Michael Jordan, then yeah, you got to watch that. It's incredible stuff. Right on, man. Uh... I noticed I uh, I posted one of your reviews today for the Grifters. Yeah, the Grifters is an interesting yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. Have you That's ever seen been that on my before? radar? No, it's been on my radar for a while. I haven't. Watched yeah, it. yeah, you would like that one a lot. It's a yeah, you know, very smart film, witty film, and uh, all three of those performances are just a knockout. 
uh, Annette Benning, Angelica Houston, and John, John Cusack. I never thought I'd say John Cusack had a knockout performance, <laughs> but uh, he does. He does in The Grifters. And then, uh, yeah, and Angelica Houston, man, is just out of this world. My family's always been a big fan of the, of the Cuse. We, uh... Well, well, you know, um, for me, he, he came, I would say that's like more our parents' generation, you know, because he, came, he, was, yeah. huge, he was huge during the 80s and the 90s. And just for me, I, it's more like the movies that came out were like Hot Tub Time Machine. <laughs> Yeah. Come on, you know, uh, you know, so just it, it leaves a weird taste in your mouth when you're a kid. And that, look, those are the movies that are coming out and you're just like, oh, these are silly. But uh, yeah. yeah, if you go back and you look, oh, man, yeah, he, he has some really cool performances. I will always go straight to 1408. Like he fucking kills it in that movie. That's, that's one of the yeah, scariest movies that's, I've ever seen. That's underrated. You're right. <laughs> Fuck yeah. I watched this movie yesterday uh, called Presumed Innocent. With uh, Harrison Ford, Brian Dennehy, and Raul Julia. And it was okay. It was an interesting courtroom drama. The courtroom scenes were riveting. It's Raul Julia's greatest performance. He was unbelievable. Yeah. But the film is very slow at the, in the beginning, and it kind of peters off. Like, you're kind of just <laughs> left to... I mean, it tells you, like... The whole, deal, the whole film is about... Uh, Harrison Ford is a prosecutor who is... Uh, arrested for the murder of a colleague after it's revealed they were sleeping together and he claims he didn't do it but the whole movie you you kind of think he might have done it and the end of the movie does tell you what happened and it's pretty fucking mind-blowing but the build-up to that is just so kind of by the numbers i feel like it really should have been a more of a knockout and harrison ford is just kind of walking you know sleepwalking his way through the whole thing he's it's very much feels like a paycheck gig for him but ah, everyone else was very committed that's frustrating. Yeah, I hate that. Come on, Harry. <laughs> uh, reminded me a bit of Frantic. Like, oh, okay, the same kind okay. of tone of Frantic, but just not the same quality. Yeah, no, Frantic's got some great stuff in it. Um, yeah, I also watched, um, I don't, I, I think, I, yeah, I had texted you my first two Jean Luc Godard films. Yes. Uh, right. Yeah, Breathless and Contempt. Oh, my gosh. This Fucking guy. Breathless. Jesus Christ. This guy is. Uh, this guy's a good, good, good uh, filmmaker. You know, obviously, obviously, I'm very, um, very behind in that regard. Uh, I, I just hadn't, haven't got around to any of his movies, and now I have access to like 20 of them. So, uh, I'm gonna start watching them. And I, you know, I chose those two because those are, you know, real early 60s. And uh, wow, just stellar, stellar filmmaking. So I, I, I forgot that Godard did Breathless. I have. I've seen that movie a couple times, and I hate that movie so much. Why? Breathless is – all right, so I watched it for the first time in my intro to film class my sophomore year of college. I figured, I figured right, a lot of his films are used for – yeah, yeah. Yeah, I figured for classes, yeah. And I thought, like, this is so poorly written. The guy is such a dick. Like, how do you root for anybody in this movie? This oh is... yeah, no, there's yeah, no, no, no. A lot, well, a lot. I think a lot. Of what I've read, a lot of his stuff doesn't have like redeemable characters. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I. But you know, I kind of like movies like that. That's why I like the like the way we have this podcast set up. Like, you come at this stuff from a stylistic point of view. I come at this stuff from a narrative point of view. So it's like yeah. Statler and Waldorf here. Like we got a whole <laughs> thing going on because I hate movie. I hate some movies for having a lack of a narrative or a lack of redeemable characters or interesting characters. You can look right past that and just see all the cool like visuals and how the film is made. And that's I, I admire that. I wish I could do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it comes down to like um, just how you and I, how we fell in love with movies or film, you know, yeah. um, it's just different the way. And the way I found it was was kind of through uh, how do I like what's the most like escapist, you know, like what's the most interesting way I can go out there. And that's why I like got really, really into horror, you know, yeah, it's uh, it like, oh, man, this there, there's no rules here. Holy shit. Uh, <laughs> and, and talk about, you know, a movie we we're talking about t today is uh, Alien is just is breaking all the barriers, man. It's awesome. Yeah. And that's a great segue. Um, so how did you first discover Alien? Um, yeah, I want to shout out a uh, huge shout out here to one of my um, a guy who showed me a few movies. And this would be one of them about five years ago. His name's Marty Cruz. Uh, I lived with him. He's one of my uh, older brothers, one of my uh, Adam's uh, good friends. 
uh, they lived together at College Station, so I'd visit all the time. He went to A and M, and he just, you know, he he liked horror a lot, and he liked, you know, punk rock music, and so I just kind of we just kind of got along. And, you yeah. know, this is this is a while back, you know, yeah, five years ago. So, um, he he told me you got to see Alien, you know. And I was like, yeah, I, you know, I've heard about it, of course, you know, uh, really Scott's masterpiece, some would say, and uh, you know, I knew I had to see it, but he pushed me, he really pushed me, and sat down and watched it with me, and. Uh, you know, just didn't allow me to get up. <laughs> he was like, no, watch this, watch this scene, watch this, you know, watch the way the camera moves here. Look at the production design, look at these costumes, uh, you know. So, yeah, I just got a shout out to Marty Cruz, man. He's the one who showed it to me. And sometimes it takes a person's passion for something to get you to that to, to that finish line, you know. Oh, and, very uh, true. Yeah, I got to give it up to him because he showed it to me. And this actually today was the second time I've ever seen it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was a treat rewatching it. It's a it's a very, very well crafted movie. Um and, and, and intense intense as hell less is more man less is more oh yeah this movie is one of the most atmospheric and intense horror films ever made and you barely see anything i love that you don't see the monster in its entirety until the last few minutes yeah exactly and you know obviously we we bring up a movie uh from 1975 a lot on here called jaws the less is more is just that's the way to go. You know, it's been proven time and time again. You just that's that's what you do. You uh, you you tease us, you tease us, you tease us, and then bam, and that's that's you know that's what the people want. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. I've been a fan of Alien for most of my life. I watched it for the first time when I was about eleven or twelve years old. Nice with my, da- with my dad. He was a big fan of the movie and he wanted to show me horror. I knew about the scene, the chest burster scene. I knew about that. Everybody knew about that. Yeah, I had seen clips of this movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well before I saw it, yeah. So I was watching it with my dad, and I wasn't scared by it. I was expecting to be scared by it. I wasn't scared, but I was entranced. I thought, like, this is really neat. And from there, I found Aliens, and then I just felt – I was like, this is fucking awesome. So yeah, I, it's, it's been a big part of, of my film fandom for a while, and it, it's, it'll be fun to talk about it today. Well, yeah, and you, you think about the time it came out. You just can't – you can't believe it. You – you really can't believe it. It's 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 over 40 years old now, and it just doesn't that doesn't make any sense. It looks gorgeous, and I you know it looks better than most movies that come out today, man. Like sci-fi movies that come out today that try to use all these, you know, it's it's that you know practicality that we always talk about with you know like uh the, these guys that were just very skilled at this time. This is what they had to do, and it, it is just gorgeous. Oh, a, mo- a monumentous part of this movie is the set design. Yeah, I mean, oh, this- yeah. This is unbelievable. It's like a future interstellar haunted house. It's crazy. Yeah. And I love it. It's become iconic. Just like the design of this film alone has sparked so many nightmares. (laughs) Yeah, including myself. Yeah. Oh, boy. So Alien was the second film by Ridley Scott after his debut 1977 film The Duelists. He became a cult film icon with Alien. Some of his later work includes Blade Runner. Legend, Thelma and Louise, Gladiator, Hannibal, Black Hawk Down, Matchstick Men, American Gangster, and The Martian. So, suffice it to say, Scott has had a hell of a fucking career. Yes, he has. <laughs> I would say at this point he's like become underrated. Uh, not not a name you just you, you just don't hear it enough in conversation. And it's almost like his his resume is so long, <laughs> <laughs> has has spanned over almost fifty years now. You know, and like you said, the last one he did was The Martian. Like, the dude's still on it, man. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Like, a lot of people don't know that the same man's responsible for all of those films. It's it, pretty exactly, crazy. Exactly, exactly. It's like it's like when you <laughs> hear a bunch of songs over and over and someone's like, yeah, those are all the Beatles. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. That, that range and that ability to, you know, constantly create something that's so – so fucking out there i love that man oh it's great he's been nominated for four oscars best director for thelma and louise gladiator and black hawk down and a best picture producing nod for the martian which he shared with simon kinberg michael schaefer and mark huffam oh man real quick uh you know gladiator was one of the first movies i was like able to see my mom and dad really wanted to show it to me it was just one of those ones they were like oh well like we want to watch it with you you know i was young you know yeah. And I, I just remember that was one of the first ones where I was like, oh, that's a good that's what a good movie can be, you know? Yeah. Wow. And uh, yeah, you know, obviously, as a kid, you don't know it's directed by Ridley Scott. But wow, just 
<laughs> Hats off to that guy, man. Holy shit. Oh, for sure. My intro to Scott was Alien. Okay, that's awesome. And what, Which, what else? What else like really stands out to you personally? To me personally, honestly, and this is gonna sound weird, but Hannibal. <laughs> uh, this is gonna sound weird, but Matchstick Men. I fucking love Matchstick Men. The movie is fucking funny. <laughs> All right, it's underrated. It's underrated. Oh. We gotta we gotta find a way to do that one on here because it's got two guys we both love. <laughs> We will. I honestly can't believe we talked about this in a past episode, but we're over 100 in and we have not yet touched Nicolas Cage. I cannot believe that. I know. I know. We're yeah, going to figure we, it out. We, we've mentioned Raising Arizona here and there, you know, uh, when we yeah. did the Coen's podcast, when we did the 80s, you know, we talked about Raising Arizona. But you're right. We haven't just tackled a cage. And uh, as of recently, he has some horror movies. Yeah, I think it's time for a cage match. We're going to have to look into that. <laughs> Let's fucking do it. <laughs> oh. So, Alien was written by Dan O'Bannon, who borrowed heavily from his and director John Carpenter's debut 1974 film, Dark Star, which features an alien antagonist that's literally a spray-painted giant beach ball. Dark Star is a piece of shit. <laughs> it, it has not aged well at all. Yikes. Yeah, I, I, I haven't gotten to that one. Maybe I should skip it? I hate Dark Star. I gave it a three on, my, on the website. Oh. It, is one of, it is easily Carpenter's worst film, and that's including The Ward. That is a terrible movie, oh, Dark Star. It was tough. made on a budget that nobody that they didn't have. Like the bad guy's a beach ball, and the comedy doesn't make sense. It's a snooze fest, despite being an hour and twenty minutes long. <laughs> it is so bad. Oh, that's wonderful. I can't believe it's the same man that made Halloween and Escape from New York. I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, that's the yeah. That's what's funny about him is like if I really you know I call him you know because he's like someone I've you know, to, within the past couple of years, like really gotten into. Yeah. But if I really watch all of it, <laughs> I'm going to be like, ah, there's some shit there, you know? And uh, that's just, that's, that's, it's hard, man. You know, <laughs> when you don't have money, it's hard. <laughs> I don't know. Some, a lot of directors have pulled that off. <laughs> well, well, he has, I mean, the thing is, Carpenter has. the yeah. thing is spectacular. It just, you know, he missed sometimes, <laughs> but it's hard to like, this was his start. I can't imagine seeing that movie and then giving this guy funding for anything. <laughs> well, then he did Assault on Precinct 13 and was like, Thank hey, I, hey I, I can get a little gritty, too. Come on. Thank now. God for that movie. <laughs> no, that well, that is let's be honest. That is really the start of his career. That's when people were probably like, oh, shit. You know, this is oh. this guy's real. Yeah. Big time. We've, we covered that in Halloween. It's the movie that got him noticed. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's like, hey, if you can if a guy can brilliant make a movie that's, you know, within basically within one room the whole time. Come on. You know, it's that's a sign of a good director right there. <laughs> so making Dark Star uh, left Dan O'Bannon unsatisfied and he knew he wanted to do an alien movie with some oomph. So he began working on a story he called Star Beast, but he later changed it to Alien because Star Beast is a terrible fucking title. Yeah, Star Beast is like what, you know, you know, like in Step Brothers, that's like what they would name their, you know, their gr their group or whatever. That's Star like Star Beast idea. produced by Prestige Worldwide. That's like an idea they'd have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh my god, that's perfect. I was thinking it sounded it it sounded like a movie poster in the background of a Simpsons episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Why do I do what I do? <laughs> so O'Bannon and his story partner, Ronald Shusette, began to pitch the alien script to various studios as, quote, Jaws in space. <laughs> Which there is, you go. Yeah. You, you, you've talked about that. It's pretty, that's a pretty go. good way to define this movie. They, uh, they nearly signed a deal with Roger Corman, but a friend promised to get them a better deal, and they signed a deal with the newly formed Brandywine Productions, which had ties to 20th Century Fox. And I'm very glad they didn't go with Corman because he would have made Alien a low budget joke. He would have made Dark Star again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, Corman's done some good movies. Uh, Death Race 2000 comes to mind. That's an awesome movie. But most of his stuff is pretty low budget goofy shit. And I, I'm so glad Alien didn't end up in his hands. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Oof. So Walter Hill and David Giller of Brandywine were not satisfied with O'Bannon and Shusette's script, so they revised it, causing a bit of tension with the original writers. This was a tense writer's room. O'Bannon was very protective of Alien. Some of these revisions include the android character Ash, as well as tightening the dialogue. So in O'Bannon's treatment and his original script, there was no robot. But I think it's a great little 
bit in the movie. It really, I think it builds the world. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you, you know, that's, that's one of those calls that someone like sees the big picture of it and it's like, Hey, in the long run, uh, I think we might need this. Well, the more I read about Dan O'Bannon, the more I got the vibe that he was very much a my way or the highway. I wrote the story. Why do you need to change it? Kind of guy, which you can't work. You can't be that kind of guy in Hollywood, especially when you don't have clout, which he didn't have clout. No. And, and come on, man, you're, you're making a sci-fi movie. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta give a little get to get a little, come on now. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, you're nobody and you're pitching to Fox. You got to have some leeway here. <laughs> you can't just be like, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, I love this movie, but like selling it, you can't just be like, yeah, you know, people are going to talk for a long time. And then, you know, then the alien's going to pop out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, you got to really sell that. And, you know, yeah, you need you need some stuff for the yeah for the audience to get involved. So speaking of Fox, they had no interest in financing a science fiction film. Science fiction was a goofy genre that nobody wanted to touch. It wasn't wasn't profitable. So Alien sat on a desk until 1977 when a little film called Star Wars destroyed box office records and suddenly sci-fi was all anyone wanted to make. Everyone mm. wanted another Star Wars. And Fox had one sci-fi script on their plate and it was Alien. <laughs> Weird, funny how things work out, huh? <laughs> Yeah, it, it, isn't it? <laughs> we went. We would never have had Alien without Star Wars. <laughs> oh no, I mean, yeah, that the the wave that Star Wars caused and created is is still going. It's one of the most significant <laughs> films in pop culture history. Like, oh yeah, it, if not the like, most. <laughs> and you you know the '80s, you know more than more than anyone I know. Um, <laughs> the the '80s is a uh, is a cause and effect of star wars it's it's uh lots of lots of sci-fi a lot of fantasy a lot of you know comedy involved lots of just everything jumbled up and just fucking entertainment you know yeah and uh it's just there's a lot of gold in there if you look in the right places for sure i think sci-fi more than any other genre has a lot of uh a lot of goofy shit yeah but i think um, even the goofy shit has something to say it's weird. And, it, and it's rewarding, man. It's rewarding to to go down that road and, and just like uh, embrace your embrace your weird, you know, <laughs> just let it let it happen. And in the 80s, it just felt like there's there's an understanding of like, yeah, we're just going to we're just going to be weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. And, and you know, yeah, you, it's caused by that 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 nerdy. It's like cool to be nerdy. You know, and that's happening again now with the MCU. Um yeah. And I think video games take a part of that, like the, you know, online video games and streaming. But it's like everyone does. It's not just nerds who are like into comic books and Iron Man and those guys. It's like everybody's into it. And that's kind of what Star Wars did back in the 70s is like it didn't just get popular. It wasn't like cool for people like you and I who just love movies. No, it like was popular amongst everyone, just people in general, because it was so cool. And, it, you know, it just got people interested in stuff. And that's I love that. I'm, I, I like I have huge respect for that. I don't love Star Wars. Like I think Aliens a much better movie than the first Star Wars, but that's just me. And that I, I think a lot of people disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> you could say that, yeah. <laughs> I think I think a lot do, yeah. <laughs> Alien will never have Star Wars numbers. <laughs> no, of course not. Of course not. That's okay. Yeah. We but they don't need it. You know, they've no. got us. They've got people like us still talking we'll be, about it. We'll be right here. <laughs> Absolutely. So the now iconic design of the creature itself came from the twisted mind of Hans Rudi Geiger. H.R. Geiger, as he's known, was a Swiss painter known for his bizarre visuals of man and machine fused together in a cold biomechanical codependence. He had a very strange style. Yes. Uh, O'Bannon wanted to hire him on as a designer after meeting him on the set of the David Lynch film Dune. Geiger came up with the designs of the eggs, the face hugger, the chest burster, and the alien itself. Every great visual of this movie can be traced back to the insane mind of H.R. Geiger. That guy has some fucked up nightmares. Yeah. Oh yeah, I would God. love to uh, I'd love to have, sit down and have a conversation. God, I I'd be afraid to. I mean, this guy came up it, with some of the sickest shit in horror. Is that is that something you're interested in? Like I was talking to my brother on the phone earlier. Is that something you're interested in? Like 
talking to someone who's like that kind of like dark and like their mind is like can go there is that some or you just like oh i'd just rather watch your stuff i don't know if i'd want to i don't i feel like i wouldn't want to know i'd feel like i need that separation in order to enjoy the work yeah but then again i mean how do you pass up that opportunity (laughs) it's a tough road yeah and it doesn't even need to be you know it doesn't need to be like a long you know you can just like sit down and talk for 10 minutes you know like yeah. Pick pick their brain for a second and then you know move on. Uh, it doesn't have to be like a. <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like I I I feel like I would not pass that up. Uh, <laughs> a chance to talk to someone like that, or you know, it, for that matter, any of these guys, these guys who are a part of this this huge wave of of the weird. <laughs> you know, I I would love to talk to any of them. Oh, for sure. Well, regrettably, we can't talk to H.R. Geiger. No, he I mean, hey, yeah. David Lynch is still here. You know, there's some there's some guys that are still here, still trying <laughs> to, you know, do do strange stuff. <laughs> True. Regrettably, Geiger died in 2014 at age 74 due to injuries sustained from a fall. Sucks. Which, yeah, he, he tripped and he fell and he died. Yeah, I, I, rem- I remember reading that and I was just like, what the? F- uh, that sucks so bad. But he gave us one hell of a nightmarish creature that we are still talking about and still haunting haunted by yeah and these are the these are the names that you should know just like you should know the name really scott because yeah. that shit if that's not there if that job is not done then there's no we're not talking about alien you know so you have to you like have i love that you pointed that out i was going to if you didn't i knew you were <laughs> <laughs> but but just uh yeah genius work well, thank God he was there because the original design was this weird centipede looking thing that just yeah, looked ridiculous. I, I saw that before we before we recorded. I saw that on my phone. I was looking up some pictures and I was like, what in the hell? Thank <laughs> thank the Lord that this is yeah not what we looked at. <laughs> well, like this wasn't on the poster or anything. Jeez Louise. That was the Star Beast. And then Geiger created the alien. <laughs> <laughs> thank God for Geiger. Oh, thank God. Oscar nominee Sigourney Weaver was cast as Ellen Ripley. Weaver was a relative unknown at the time, and if it's your first time watching the movie, you have no idea she's going to be the main character until the end of the movie. This movie doesn't really have it, – it kind of – it's all about the crew. There's no real main character until everyone starts dying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, slowly, quickly, I don't know. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Weaver would go on to be nominated for her performances in 1986's Aliens, 1988's Working Girl, and 1988's Gorillas in the Mist. She would go on to portray Ripley in three sequels, and to date, it's the role she's most known for. And I'm glad she's embraced that. Yeah, agreed. Agreed, because it's because it's an awesome role. <laughs> <laughs> I remember early in its development, when they were going to do Alien vs. Predator, they were trying to get Sigourney Weaver to be Ripley and Arnold Schwarzenegger to be Dutch, which would have been fucking nuts. It wouldn't have made any sense, but it would have been nuts. <laughs> Jeez, man. <laughs> what on earth? I don't know. I don't know who comes up with this shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I swear there's I swear like, you know, the writers of like fucking Rick and Morty are <laughs> making this shit up. <laughs> I feel like 90% of the films we do come from just mountains of cocaine. <laughs> oh, no doubt. I mean, yeah. A like lot more of the than stuff, a human body is capable of doing. So much of the stuff you and I love is fueled by drugs. <laughs> <laughs> true. Very true. Uh, Stephen King. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Oh, moving on, uh, Tom Skerritt was cast as Dallas, the captain of the Nostromo. Skerritt is known for his roles in Top Gun, Contact, and the original MASH movie. He appeared in a ton of bit part TV roles before being cast in Alien, and he never really moved on from it. He's had bit parts ever since. He's still working, but never really took off Tom Skerritt. But, yeah, but he but he is awesome in this. Oh, he's great as Dallas. If you know Tom Skerritt, you pretty much you like Tom Skerritt. Yeah. yeah. There was a running gag in the movie Ted where one of the characters claims he was best friends with Tom Skerritt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I haven't seen Ted since theaters. Holy shit. <laughs> That's a funny movie. Yeah. At I'll end, check it out again. Yeah. It's great. The the Skerritt gag really pays off at the end. I won't mention it because you're you'll you'll be surprised and you'll laugh. 
<laughs> yeah, I haven't yeah. seen it in ages, you know, since it came out. And I've I've been I've been rewatching some like old Family Guy here and there. Man, oh God, it used to be so good. I just don't like the newer episodes as much because it feels like they, it's too gimmicky now. It used to just be fucking straight up comedy, man. You know, the oh, yeah. first three first three or four seasons. Oh boy, golden uh, stuff. They stopped trying a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's just it's just like all right, uh, we need yeah we need something so like let's just have like a scene of like straight violence you know or like two like what <laughs> it, it, it used to it used to be yeah uh, you, they used to have a lot better stuff you know well then you had like Stewie you like wanting to kill his mom <laughs> every character it's like, is completely different from who they were at the beginning yeah yeah but you know yeah we, we yeah sorry I went off on Family Guy but I'll, I'll rewatch Ted soon. <laughs> I'm going to stay in Family Guy for a second. I hate what they did with Brian. He is such an unlikable douchebag now, and I can't stand it. Yeah, okay, he's he's one of my favorite cartoon characters ever, Brian is. But I'm with you. I can't. I try to look away from all that because it's not uh, It's not true to him. It's just not. I, I don't, yeah, I don't like it. I don't, I don't approve. Uh, most of the episodes are just kind of, yeah, filler to me. Yeah, I agree. I, I gave up on Family Guy. I just, I couldn't, I, I wasn't enjoying it anymore. No, yeah, you, you need to know when to stop, man. <laughs> True. Uh, well, back to Alien. Oscar nominee Ian Holm plays Ash, the science officer and secret android. Holm was nominated for his role in 1981's Chariots of Fire. Some of his other films include The Fifth Element, From Hell, Time Bandits, Brazil, and The Lord of the Rings as Bilbo Baggins. And he is great in, in Alien. Ian Holm kills it. <laughs> oh yeah, and I mean, I just I uh, anyone who takes part in Lord of the Rings <laughs> is dear to my heart, and I think yours too. Yes, uh, yes and he, yeah, he's great in this. Uh, I don't really know. It might take some talking about it to know who my favorite character is, man. I don't know. They're all so good. Oof. Yeah, that's, that's a, tough. I, it's tough. I just finished. It. You mean Alien or Lord of the Rings? Uh, oh, Lord of the Rings, it's, like, damn near impossible, but Alien. <laughs> My favorite character in Alien? <sighs> yeah, I don't know. It's tough. It's You're it's right. tough. It's kind of a group effort, you know? They're all really good. Everyone yeah. really does a great job, and everyone sticks out, which is yeah. which is tough in these movies. Uh, Veronica Cartwright plays Lambert. Cartwright has also appeared in such films as The Witches of Eastwick, The Birds... Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The Right Stuff, and she had a recurring role on The X-Files as alien abductee Cassandra Spender. And I remember that arc. It was in season five. It was it was all right. Nice. But, uh, it was cool that she was there, you know, a, sci- a horror sci-fi veteran there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. I mean, yeah, if you worked with Hitchcock and then you did – and you were an alien. Yeah, that's just – that's awesome. I can't fucking believe that. When I found that, I was like, she was in The Birds. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> I yeah I, I I'm a, ah man I haven't seen that one in a long time either. That's a great movie. That there's just there's so many movies I want to rewatch just to get that. I, I love getting that you know that freshener you know and just kind of diving back in and finding new things and that, you know who better than Hitchcock to rewatch? Oh without a doubt. We might do that one actually coming up because we have access to that on the voodoo account so we might we might do the birds in the next month or so sweet and i think there's some stuff on criterion by him if i'm not mistaken so we could we could take a look oh i bet hitchcock's been in the criterion many times yeah yeah i just don't know you know sometimes there's there's guys like you look them up and they don't have anything on there at the moment it's like oh fuck (laughs) (laughs) oh darn Uh, but there's just there's so much shit so i can't complain (laughs) character actor vet harry dean stanton plays brett one of the engineers Stanton had over 200 credits to his name as an actor. Some of his more well-known films include The Green Mile, Escape from New York, The Last Temptation of Christ, Wild at Heart, The Avengers, and Twin Peaks Firewalk with Me. Stanton died in 2017 at age 91 from natural causes, but he has, he'd been around forever. He was just that guy in a shit ton of movies. And uh, <sighs> yeah. to me, he'll always be Brain from Escape from New York. That's... Yeah, man. Ah, oh, man. Harry Dean. <laughs> Harry Dean is one of those guys, too, that not only has he been everywhere, but he's been everywhere in stuff that we fucking love, you know? Uh, yeah. Nerd, nerdy shit, you know? It's like he's <laughs> he's one of our people, you know? I, yeah, he's he's awesome. And, yeah, he he's great in the Twin Peaks Return. Fucking great. Cool. I haven't gotten to his uh, – he's been in a couple scenes, but I haven't gotten to his meat of this yet. 
I just it, I'm in the middle of it. And I just met Tim Roth, which was so fucking weird. Oh, dude. <laughs> yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's the shit that you just pops up and you're like, what? <laughs> For Lynch, man, for Lynch. It's so cool to see all the actors who wanted to just be a part of this, which is – that's the neatest part about this return. I, oh, for sure, is the cameos and just, yeah, the, the sheer firepower of it, yeah. Back to Stanton, though, it's – it was so weird seeing him in the Avengers. Like, he's – there's no reason for him to be there beyond Joss Whedon wanted him to be in there because he's yeah. probably a fan. Yeah, yeah. He's the janitor who shows up to the – crater that the hulk leaves when banner wakes up and he's like you know son you have a condition it's it's such an odd scene and it's so weird that it's terry dean stanton (laughs) like why i don't know (laughs) i don't know i think the better question is why not (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's a better question because harry dean stanton is one of the ultimate that guy you know he's one of those guys who like some people don't quite remember his name you know i i the first guy that pops in my head with those guys is John C. McGinley. Oh, just like, yes. He just pops up in all kinds of random shit, and he's that guy that you're like, oh, what's his name? What's his name? Uh, and Harry Dean Stanton is the king of that shit. <laughs> See, for me, the first thing that pops into my head is William Fickner. Oh, that's a – yeah, that's yeah, – yeah, he's on the list too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love those. Those are some of my favorite people in the world. <laughs> no, it's funny. Are, are the Hardcore. bad guys. Hardcore movie fans know exactly who we're talking about right now. Casual movie fans, you don't, but you do. <laughs> yes, because because you're going to be like, oh, Harry Dean Stanton, Harry Dean Stanton. You're going to get on your phone right now. You're going to look on IMDb, and you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I've seen that guy <laughs> everywhere. Oh, uh, yeah, it's awesome. That's great. That's great. And, uh, by the way, yeah, rest in peace. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. what a career, you know? Yeah, oh, un- yeah un- unbelievable. Work until the day he died. He was in Seven Psychopaths. Like, he just kept going. Yeah. Uh, Yafit Kato plays Parker, the other engineer. Kato had a recurring role on the crime drama Homicide Life on the Street, and he was the villain in the 1973 James Bond movie Live and Let Die, which we've covered on the show before. It was bonus episode 20. So yes. check that out if you want to hear more about Live and Let Die. And if you want to watch one of the coolest uh, boat races of all time, watch oh. the movie. Oh, hell yeah. And one of the most racist Southern sheriffs ever put to film. Yes. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Oh, there's so much about that movie that's so weird. (laughs) (laughs) And finally, there's Oscar nominee John Hurt, who plays Kane, the fateful crew member who gets infected by the alien facehugger and births the monster. Hurt was an iconic British thespian who was nominated for his performances in 1978's Midnight Express and 1980's The Elephant Man. In addition, he's appeared in such films as Rob Roy, Contact, Hellboy, 1984, The Skeleton Key, Snowpiercer, and the Harry Potter franchise as Mr. Ollivander. He also had a brief cameo in Spaceballs, another past episode, as Kane, who once again has an alien burst out of his chest. Yes. Hilarious, especially since they got fucking John Hurt to do that. (laughs) Uh, If it was anybody else, it would have just been like a light chuckle, but because it's John (laughs) Hurt, it's one of the best scenes of the movie. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Oh. Hurt tragically died in 2017 at age 77 from pancreatic cancer, and his was a massive loss to film. Hurt had been around forever, and he was a fucking great actor. And every time I see films like this, I'm always remembered that, you know, he's gone. It's a shame. Yeah, I, you know, you talk about um, this movie. We've I think we've talked about three people have passed away. You know, it's just, um, yeah, this movie is over 40 years old, you know. It uh, doesn't look like it doesn't feel like it. It feels like these actors are performing in a different fucking era, too. It's just uh, every performance is a knockout. Really is. It's it's I think that's my favorite part about this one and the the, uh, the first sequel, Aliens, in 1986. It's just such a great cast of just awesome characters and people you remember and people who stand out. People you you feel bad when they die. That's important for horror. And it's rarely done. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so great. Alien has an IMDb score of 8.4, Rotten Tomatoes score of 98%. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was a big success, grossing over $100 million on a budget of $11 million, But I've seen some discrepancies where some people believe the, the uh, gross to be a lot bigger than that. I'm talking $200 million. It's very yeah. strange. It's hard to find a, a definitive number on how much this film made. Yeah, no, I've, yeah, that's like been, a, been an issue yeah. for, I for think years. That, 
It's because uh, Brandywine was uh, – they were like there was some kind of uh, issue with reporting the wrong numbers so they could pocket some extra cash. There was a lawsuit that had been set that was ongoing until like 2012 when – or no, it, my, my mistake. It was a lawsuit going on until the early 80s when Fox finally committed to Alien 2. So because of that and because of re-releases, it's tough to really nail down a, a gross on this. But – Everyone's in agreement, and it's well over 100 million gross. And uh, it won a single Oscar for best visual effects. Fucking earned it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. And was also nominated for best art direction, which I think it should have taken too, but it didn't win that one. It, uh, it spawned three sequels, two prequels, two spinoffs, not to mention comic books, video games, novels, board games, and other merchandise. This became a horror titan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um it kind of connected it's one of it's one of the movies I think there's there's a lot including, you know, Jaws uh that connects the horror and, you know, obviously mainstream really well and gets gets people who like movies interested in it whether it's horror or not. Yeah, uh, because because it's a good fucking movie. Uh, you know, I I know plenty of people who like Alien that that aren't really horror fans technically, you know, that don't really seek out horror but they recognize alien as a really good movie it's true this is the movie that put my grandmother off of horror forever <laughs> <laughs> wow that yeah. is incredible this was one of the first videotapes she and my grandpa ever watched and my grandma watched this and was immediately like no way i am never watching horror movies again and she has stuck to that <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> yeah i I, I don't feel, you know, that strongly about it. But. <laughs> I, yeah, it's a, it gave my grandmother a complex. I'm still trying to get her to check stuff out, but she will not budge on that. <laughs> uh, it's a musical, I swear, I swear. Hereditary. <laughs> oh, my God. My my uncle try, uh, convinced her to go see a movie, uh, and he, she still gives him shit about this. He convinced her that 1408 wasn't that scary. <laughs> And uh, turns out it was. It was quite scary. Yeah, it is pretty frightening. Yeah. <laughs> and that's coming from a horror fan vet who's seen a sh- ton of stuff. My grandma has seen like Alien and Psycho. And that was back when they came out. <laughs> so <laughs> the fact that she sat through 1408 is pretty amazing to me. The, yeah, that's that's a feat. Yeah, well done. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so... Uh... Let's get into the plot of Alien. Let's do it. So we open on space. And a dark, desolate, empty space. This is a space with nowhere to go. This is the the great unknown. <laughs> and it's already you're like, we're in for some dark shit. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. It, it immediately sets the tone. It's cinematography is right on point yes and you 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 immediately are like uh yep i'm in good fucking hands here the subtle but impressive score plays over the the opening credits cast and then you see the word alien slowly start to appear at the top of the screen gorgeous yeah (laughs) so i think he did the same thing later with prometheus yes yeah you're right i haven't seen that one like since it came out but uh yeah yeah you're right I've, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that later, but I've given that film a few chances and it just doesn't do it for me. Damn it. Yeah, I've only seen it once. Yeah. <laughs> so we meet the crew of the Nostromo, a commercial towing space vehicle. It's uh, carrying a, a refinery of 20 million tons of mineral ore. It's en route to Earth. Crew of seven. 20 million tons of mineral ore. That's another thing about this movie I like. These aren't, you know, Hollywood, you know, superstars. These aren't chiseled teenagers. These are blue collar workers. These are dudes with. You know, beards and jobs. <laughs> like these are people who've seen some shit before the alien even shows up. These are battle worn workers. And I love yeah. Those yeah, are- yeah. Yeah, you, you you feel a sense of um immediately wanting to root for them no matter what what's gonna happen. Yeah. And uh I, I, I think it's uh cool that you pointed out before I even like dug into the plot earlier that it's kind of a it's it's like it's a group effort, you know. It's uh all all of them together and you you kind of have to have seen some shit and been through some shit to to work together, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're not. Yeah, they're not just a bunch of like selfish assholes. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. It's refreshing. 
Well, you get the vibe that, you know, they're, they're friends. There's been some camaraderie. They've been on more than a few missions together. Yeah. They have relationships. They've broken relationships. Like, these people have been through the ringer. They've been they've lived their lives in space. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Talk about a lonely life, man. Just nowhere. Like, no other human beings for millions of mi- millions of miles. I can't imagine that kind of life. No, no, me neither, man. Ugh. I could I I couldn't do it. I I that's frightening to me. <laughs> the uh I was watching on Bravo's uh, 100 scariest movie moments, which I've talked about a few times on this show. Uh Alien comes in at number 2 on that on that list. Wow. <laughs> I know. It beats The Exorcist. And Yeah, um, I, I I remember looking over that. I do not remember it being number 2. Wow. Yeah. And somebody, I don't remember who it was, but they described uh they said 2001 A Space Odyssey is white-collar space, and Alien is blue-collar space. <laughs> and I love that. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> it's so true. That's this movie funny is as not, hell. Yeah, this movie's not pretty. It's not, you know, the future. It's not Star Trek future. It's not shiny. It's not, you know, one one planet, one goal. This is a future where... You have to do you like they are clearly scraping the bottom of the barrel to make bare minimum here. This is a future that looks desolate and just fucking awful. <laughs> yeah, but they still I mean, gotta work, you know. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the, you know, almost like almost post-apocalyptic style that we that we both love. We love that atmosphere in movies where, you know, you know, like what John Carpenter kind of does, where it's just like, dude, this is dark, you know, and there's no one here. No, there's no help. <laughs> there's no there's no escape. You know, I, I love that feeling. Oh, yeah. So suddenly the onboard computer, or they call it mother, is activated. The lights inside the ship are activated. And executive officer Kane is the first to awaken from hypersleep. So they're not supposed to be w- awake yet. They were awakened uh, like. 50 like a good few months or years before they're uh they're supposed to be at earth and they want to know why and turns out there has been a signal intercepted from a nearby planet and everyone's like you know what kind of signal and they're like well we don't know (laughs) and we need to investigate this and parker is like not my contract i'm you know i'm here to deliver this isn't my job and ash Points out, well, actually, in our contract, it says we uh, we have to or we forfeit all payment. <laughs> Parker's like, yeah. fuck. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, I love that. <laughs> Ugh. So they decide, you know, well, I guess, you know, we have to do this before we can go back into the cryo sleep and go home. So they decide... On, you know, on penalty of loss of pay to go get in the shuttle, go down to this planet. Later in uh, Aliens, it's classified LV-426. And uh, they go on there. They The uh, Nostromo approaches the planet. They take the shuttle down. But they have a rough landing, causing some damage. Parker and Brett have to repair. They said they're going to give them you know 25 hours off. The planet is kind of windy. Visibility is low in... They have to. They start following the source of the signal. Dallas and Kane investigate on foot. Lambert joins them. Ash watches from behind a communication console. Team puts on their spacesuits. Ripley has gone to the lower deck to inspect repairs. There's some animosity between Ripley and the engineers. For not sure. Very, it's not made clear why. Um, there's a director's cut of this movie, which I haven't seen in a while. There's some extra scenes. I don't remember if they address that. But, uh... I don't know. It just it, it adds to the uh, camaraderie and the believability that these guys have. You know, this isn't their first mission. They've been together for a while. You work together in close quarters with people like this, especially in space. You're gonna get pissy. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, you're gonna pick people you don't like. You're gonna pick petty reasons not to like them. I get it. <laughs> so mother has not yet deciphered the signal. Uh, Ripley decides to give it a crack. She Gets to a console, starts working on the signal. Outside, the team has cleared a rock formation, and they make an amazing discovery. They see a giant crashed spacecraft. And this is in a future where we have not discovered alien life. (laughs) So this is pretty remarkable. Yeah. 
Yeah, they, uh, the crew called it the donut. <laughs> uh, That's what I would have done, too. Yeah. And this is the ship that we would later see again in Prometheus. We'll talk a bit more about that later. It's uh, everyone's kind of like, do you see that? Like everyone's kind of you know, freaking out, understandably. And uh, they decide to go in. They lose contact with the Nostromo. They find the hallways. Everything looks kind of alive. It's weird. This looks more like the skeleton of a creature than a than a ship. <laughs> it's really unnerving. It, yeah, extremely. Yeah, talk about talk about atmosphere, man, and just um, I think you you pointed out earlier the the kind of the subtle score that keeps kind of kind of kind of creeping up on you and kind of tingling. Oh man, so good. <laughs> The score acts like the alien. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, exactly. Hiding, it's, own, you know? it's own character, yeah. <laughs> so they go, they start walking through the hallways, and they find this platform. And inside this area is the remains of an enormous alien creature in a large chair. It's fossilized. This was the pilot of this ship. And it's enormous. It's like 20 feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> and they look into this. They look, and they see a wound of the bones the chest bones just protruding outwards like something exploded out of this thing <sighs> the build up in this movie is so good yeah i know <laughs> anticipation <sighs> lambert wants to get out of there understandably she's the sane one kane is very curious and he finds a hole in the floor and jumps into it <laughs> yeah 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 you just find an alien spaceship with an alien corpse in it and you find a hole in the floor and you're just like, well, let's go see what that is. <laughs> I guess you start, I guess you start losing your mind when you're, you know, uh, up there all those, all those years. Space dementia as Michael Bay once put it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. Jesus. We got to figure out a way to do Armageddon someday. Cause that is oh, one of the fucking movies. <laughs> absolute shit show. There's a, uh, <laughs> Uh, there's like, have you ever watched the Ben Affleck commentary with that movie? <laughs> Dude. Yes. That is the funniest shit. Oh, man. That's the best thing Ben Affleck's ever done. He told me to go fuck myself. <laughs> yeah, he's like, look oh, at man. look at this guy. Real salt to the earth guy. <laughs> God damn it. You're talking about Bruce Willis, man. <laughs> oh, jeez. So oh, good. Deal. That'll be a fun discussion. Oh, we got to put that on the calendar. That's fucking great. Yeah, that movie's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. So Kane goes into this hole. And uh, during all this, the analysis of the transmission suggests that it's not an SOS. It's a warning. <laughs> Don't come here. <laughs> mm, I, I forgot uh. that bit. And then like this time, you know, when I watched it, it really freaked me out. It's <laughs> such a great little touch. This alien, yeah. giant alien, warned people, don't find me. <laughs> that is awesome. Oh, my God. <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant stuff from a, a yeah, character that can't really talk. You know? <laughs> so Ripley is now concerned. She wants to go after the search party, but Ash talks her out of it, saying that by the time she gets there, the search team will probably already know what the signal means. They'll have found it. So why bother? There's so many little teases that Ash is working against them. It, wor- it works so well. Yes. So Kane goes into the hole. He finds an enormous chamber. And in one of these, like, there's a bunch of sections in the chamber. And in one of these sections, he finds thousands of eggs. Large, like, three foot tall eggs. And he says, you know, we find they're covered in these this weird, strange mist. He's telling, you know, he's talking to them on the on the comms like this is so weird there's these eggs he trips and falls into the pit (laughs) gets up touches one of the eggs and the egg opens up (laughs) and he doesn't get the fuck out of there like i would he looks into it (laughs) picks up a flashlight starts looking inside and this crab spider looking thing jumps out of the egg and latches onto his face it's one of the most terrifying – that thing is scarier than the alien, straight up. The face hugger is the scariest shit in this franchise. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. I think a movie of a bunch of those things attacking, like, a town would be awesome. It's funny because we kind of got a little bit of that in Aliens. There's a whole scene where the face hugger – they're trapped yeah, in a- Yeah, so. that's true. Yeah, you're right. I haven't seen that one in a good while either. 
And then when, when we did get face huggers attacking a town, it was in that god awful alien versus predator <laughs> review that nobody remembers. Yeah. Oh. Do you ever play the uh, any of the alien video games? No, I have not. But I, my older brother did, and I, I watched him a little bit uh, growing up. But yeah, I, n- I never never talk. I'm, I'm not a big big gamer myself. Yeah, I understand. We um, my uncle had Alien vs Predator on the PC in like like the game that was released in like 2001, and he found it in a box and we played it, and it is the scariest fucking game I've ever played. Hell yeah! You you play as a you can play as a, a marine, an alien, or a predator. And okay. obviously the scariest one's going to be the Marine. So we picked the Marine and you have like the radar and you'll be just walking through these dark tunnels and you'll just hear beep, 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 beep. Like it'll get close and then you'll just hear like a frah, and it'll jump out at you. It's the scariest oh my shit. God, dude. But when you see the, when you come across the face hover, you just hear like a, like wandering on the, on the, on the floor and then out oh, of nowhere dude. it'll stop. And then it jumps on you and it fills the whole screen and you die instantly. <laughs> yes. Holy fuck, dude. I have had more nightmares from that game <laughs> than from most things. That is so creepy. <laughs> I definitely need I need to give that a give that a go, man. That sounds awesome. <laughs> it was fun. I was I had the strategy guide and Sean was playing the game and he would just be like, fuck you, fuck you. Oh my god, fuck, fuck that. No, he would just get so freaked out. And I'm trying to say, I'm like, go right, go right. Now. Oh man, that is great. <laughs> that's oh, awesome. That's days. awesome that video games, you know, like are so good that they can scare you. You know, like that's yeah, that's awesome. Oof. And it all came out of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so great. So this thing actually melts through Kane's uh, faceplate. It me- melts through his astronaut suit. Somehow doesn't like completely just melt his face which i never really understood that bit but whatever moving on (laughs) (laughs) uh dallas and lambert start carrying unconscious kane back to the nostromo they enter the airlock and they ask ripley to let them in ripley says absolutely not we you know there's quarantine protocol for the safety of the crew you need to be kane needs to be decontaminated for 24 hours before they bring him on the ship dallas is afraid for kane's life and orders Ripley to open the door. Ripley still refuses, despite Dallas trying to pull rank and insist. However, Ash completely ignores Ripley's decision, lets him in. So it makes Ripley look like an asshole and infects, like, basically puts the entire crew at risk. <laughs> in the infirmary. Oh, yeah. Ash is a motherfucker. Totally get why we, Ripley hates robots. I mean, I'd hate robots, too, if this shit happened to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. In the infirmary, Dallas and Ash, they cut Kane's helmet open and they find this, you know, the, the face hugger attached to Kane's face. It's tail wrapped tightly around the neck. It's got these weird, like, fingers that are latched onto the back of his head. It's a weird looking creature. It is hey, so freaky looking, man. Yeah, I, well, I love that. I love the decisions they made to make these things look look not like typical aliens that you see, especially in the seventies that you'd see like drawings of and whatnot yeah. and what people thought aliens would look like. It just yeah, completely out of left field. Two years prior to this close encounters of the third of the third kind came out. And that was kind of the basis, the base form of e- that everyone considered an alien to look like, you know, tall, thin, gray skin, big, dark eyes, bald, you know, the gray aliens. We all know what those look like. So this movie really just threw that right out the fucking sp- airlock and did its own thing and yeah. i respect the hell out of that same yeah I, I think a movie like nowadays i really like the way arrival built built their uh their creatures uh, i thought it was a lot different than what we're you know, like typically used to and that's yeah. cool you know yeah make something make something a little more a little more dark you know i think that's the i love that i love that an alien yeah this is the best well i feel like this film kind of started that tradition where you know, before this, it was just a standard, tall, regular alien. But this movie created something so different that I think it inspired thousands of later horror film, later sci-fi films to want to, you know, go the extra mile to create their own unforgettable creature. I mean, and I love that. Imagine how many, you know, creatures were inspired by this. Yeah. Or, yeah, you know, people saw like, oh, man, that movie made a bunch of money and they're using 
literally using aliens. Yeah, like let's 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 get weird. <laughs> let's get weird. <laughs> I, I I don't know if you saw. I shared this in the uh, the group chat. I saw it was a a, a bootleg alien T shirt <laughs> that said Alan. <laughs> okay, I, I yeah I did see that. <laughs> <laughs> and the tagline oh, was in space no one can hear you in space that's <laughs> it was, perfect i've been laughing about that for days <laughs> fucking alan you gotta you gotta <laughs> buy that man you gotta own that <laughs> oh my god okay well <laughs> so despite <laughs> this thing being over his mouth and nose kane oh. is breathing fine he's got normal vitals it's like this thing is keeping him alive. And uh, Parker, Brett, and Lambert are observing this through a window. Ash is and Dallas are going, trying to figure out a way to get this thing off him. Ripley joins them, and uh, in the director's cut, Lambert slaps Ripley across the face very hard and yells at her for not letting them in the ship, despite, you know, quarantine procedures. And uh, I think that's a very important scene. I wish that had been left in. Yeah, why not? It doesn't seem like it need to be that long. Just throw that in there. Yeah. And uh, Dallas berates Ripley for disobeying a direct order, but Ripley says, you know, I was following protocol, and she insists, like, you know, I, you might have killed us all, <laughs> and she's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ash attempts to remove the creature with some forceps, but it tightens its grip so tight that if Ash tries to take it off. He's going to take Kane's face off with it. This thing is latched. It's not coming off. And uh, Kane is examined with a medical scanner, which shows that this creature has inserted a tube into Kane's throat and is feeding him oxygen. And Ash deduces that since Kane is comatose and the parasite's feeding him oxygen, removing the creature will probably kill Kane. But Dallas is willing to take that risk. <laughs> not, a, not a good captain. <laughs> not at this point, no. Oh, some bad decisions have led them here, man. And uh, so Ash is like, all right, let's kill this thing then. So Ash tries to cut one of the legs off, and a yellowish fluid squirts out of the wound and begins to eat through the floor. This thing has acid blood. <laughs> As if you needed to make it scarier. Disgusting. Oh, it's so great. So the acid starts bleeding through the ship. It starts, you know, getting to the hole, and they they're trying to find a way to stop this but thankfully it's uh neutralized after burning through several decks like there is just a big old hole in three different floors oh and dallas is like this stuff is molecular acid and this thing has it for blood and if we you know it's a wonderful defense mechanism you can't kill it because it'll kill you back (laughs) (laughs) oh creepy but it's such a great device because it answers the obvious question why don't they just shoot this thing well they can't his blood will kill them all. I love it. <laughs> oh. So Dallas orders everyone back to their post as, and they just leave Kane in a coma to be tended by Ash. He's just going to look through this thing and hope that he can find an answer. Parker and Brett resume the repair, saying they never should have landed on this planet. <laughs> Fucking right. <laughs> yeah, that's what you and I, that's, they're, they're us, man. We're just like, why the fuck we're we here? What are stupid. we doing? Yeah. <laughs> I was hired to collect ore and bring it back. This is not in my job description. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So Ash is collecting data on the creature, and uh, Ripley shows up in the infirmary, wants to know if Ash has found anything. And Ash can only confirm that the creature's skin is made of polysaccharides, which is slowly replaced with silicon to toughen its hide against the new environment. So this thing is designed to adapt to survive. It can survive in any environment. It can bond with any host. It is the, it's what Ash calls it later, the perfect organism. It's no wonder yeah. Waylon Tani wants this so bad. I mean, if you could figure out how to, you know, unlock this creature's DNA, you could do so much with weaponry. Oh, man. <laughs> Scary, Scary stuff, yeah. Oh, yeah, big time. And that's an ongoing thread throughout the entire franchise is Waylon Tani trying to get their hands on this damn thing. <laughs> Oh, this is reinvigorating my love of this franchise. I got to read. I got to go through the rest of these now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. I, I think I probably will in, in my own time, just kind of for fun. Yeah, man. I've got aliens. I don't have three and four because I've given those so many chances. They're so bad. But, uh, yeah, 
I, I might do it though, man. It's been, it's been, you know, like, yeah, four or five years since I watched them all. So, <laughs> so Ripley confronts Ash with his decision to let it, uh, let the thing aboard, ignoring the quarantine. And Ash says he did it out of concern for Kane's life. And that he temporarily forgot that when Dallas and Kane are off the ship, Ripley is the officer in charge. And Ripley tells him, you know, you breached protocol. You put all our lives at risk. Not the best behavior for a science officer. And Ash coldly lets her know that he is perfectly capable to make that decision and she should just mind her own business. <laughs> Ripley leaves. <sighs> Ash, such a cold son of a bitch. Yes, he is. <laughs> Looking back, it's it's neat to see all the little teases that he was not that he was up to something. <laughs> so Dallas is sitting in the escape shuttle when he is called to the infirmary by Ash because something has happened. The creature is gone. It's off Kane's face and it's disappeared. And Dallas, Ripley, and Ash search the infirmary and they find it when it drops off of an overhead compartment right onto Ripley. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. <laughs> And it's dead, you know, but it ha- you know, as it has the uh, a reflex. If you poke it, it'll go like, it'll, but uh, it's dead. <laughs> Ripley wants to blow it out the airlock, but Ash is like, no, we can't. This is a new creature. We need to take it back to Earth to test it. And Dallas is like, all right, Ash, it's your decision. And Ripley's like, are you fucking kidding me? There's nobody <laughs> hearing me on this ship. <laughs> From the beginning, she's been the most logical, like, we can't do this, but everyone's like, ah, fuck it. (laughs) Jeez. And Ripley tries to talk some sense into Dallas, but he's like, no, I run this ship. Ash's final word on everything science, and that's my final say on things. Ripley asks if Dallas has ever worked with Ash before. Dallas says he did five tours with the same science officer, and then two days before they left Earth, Ash replaced that science officer. Very interesting. Almost like somebody needed Ash to be here. Hmm, like someone planted Ash. Perhaps the company? (laughs) Ripley admits that she doesn't trust Ash. Dallas says, well, I don't trust anybody. Ooh, rebel. (laughs) That's such a tough guy asshole thing to say. I don't trust anybody. He might, he might as well have uh, a cowboy hat and squinted his eyes while he, when he said that. Yeah, yeah, and then he just starts floating from the, the you know, no gravity. That would be pretty funny. He's trying to be serious. <laughs> <laughs> Whoop. That never comes up. I guess they have, you know, uh, button for that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I, I, I always think that's, like, amazing in movies, you know. Yeah. When folks are floating. Like, that's, like, one of the most fascinating, probably, you know, one of the only fascinating parts of Ad Astra. Was that 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 bit of violence uh, when they're kind of yeah floating in air and it's just kind of stuff happens by chance. That movie really came and went. We were like the only people to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, it really did. There's yeah, there there really are only a couple scenes that are uh, memorable. It's a it's, it's a bad movie. I'll say it. Yeah, it's, it's a bad movie. <laughs> Pit 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 is pretty good in it, but uh you know that's uh not enough to watch it. True. So. Uh. Dallas wants to he wants to get the hell out of there. He asks the state of the repairs. They're underway. They're not done yet. But they managed to take off successfully. And uh, the ship docks with the refinery in orbit. And the Stromo resumes its course for Earth. The crew is back in the mess hall bickering with what to do about Kane. Dallas decides that they're all just going to get back in hypersleep. Lambert is calculated it's going to take another 10 months to get back to Earth, which ever pisses everyone off. Ash suddenly calls Dallas to the infirmary because Kane is awake. He's groggy, but he's unharmed. He doesn't remember what happened. He doesn't feel any different. He has a nightmare about being smothered, but he's starving and he wants to eat. So the crew decide to have one last meal before they enter hypersleep. Thus begins one of the most infamous scenes in horror history. Yes. <laughs> oh, it's still – it's so good, man. It's so perfect. This This one scene – changes the face of the fucking movie it changes yeah. the game it's so good <laughs> separates the men from the boys oh yes so they're all eating they're having a good time they're laughing kane's you know eating food like he hasn't eaten in ages ash is looking right at him just you know observing him coldly suddenly kane starts choking initially thinking you know he's swallowed some bad food everyone's still joking around but then he starts screaming and convulsing 
they he falls on the table. They're holding him down, trying to figure out something. One of the people is trying to shove a pen in his mouth so he doesn't bite his tongue off. He's writhing. He's screaming. And then his chest suddenly bursts open, and this small alien creature crawls out of his rib cage. <laughs> Jesus, I've seen this so many times, but it still blows my fucking mind every time I see this. Yeah, it's insane. The audacity to go through with that scene is oh. so awesome, man. I love it. You imagine being a studio exec in 79, or like I said, at the time, like 77, 78, reading that and being like, are you fucking serious? <laughs> I mean, nothing oh to that cow would come out. Like, maybe The Exorcist, but this is on a different level, man. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. So everyone's just like, what the fuck? This thing jumps out of cane, runs across the the um, the, the mess hall, and disappears. <laughs> everyone's just like, what in the fuck was that? What do we do? And they're like, well, we got to find this thing. So they have a short funeral for Kane, and they blast his ass into space. <laughs> Perfect. A little unceremonious, especially since the body kind of flipped. <laughs> it made me laugh. <laughs> it was, you know, like I, I was comparing it to like Star Trek II: Wrath of Khan, when they, like, like Spock's funeral was so dignified, and they launched the coffin into space, and it just kind of floats away. <laughs> and then this is just like. <laughs> Oh my god. Making a fucking field goal. It was ridiculous. Oh boy. <laughs> so they decide to break into two teams to try to find and capture this thing. Not kill it. Ash is pretty insistent on that. So Ash rigs together a tracking device that they, they can uh, can detect changes in uh I don't remember. <laughs> changes in something. And uh Parker, Brett, and Ripley investigate one of the lower decks, finding the power has been disrupted despite the repairs having been finished. So they pick up a signal. They think they have the creature cornered in a cabinet. They prepare to catch it in a net, only to find that it's not the alien. It's the cat, the crew's cat, Jonesy. <laughs> Why the crew has a cat is beyond me. Does the cat get to sleep in stasis, or does he just wander the ship? Who knows? Cat runs away. They all have a moment of like, you know, laughing it off because they need it. I love that moment where they're all just laughing it off. Like, oh, it's just the cat. We're going to die. Brett is searching for the cat. They decide they got to catch the cat or else they're going to catch, you know, find it on the radar again. And they're going to get uh, freaked out again. Brett is searching for the cat. He goes to find it. and He finds a shed skin on the floor. <laughs> so whatever this thing was, it's getting bigger. <laughs> and uh, he eventually catches up with Jones, but Jones is scared of something. And this creature hanging in the chains above Brett drops down. It is now it's the alien. It's huge. It's got four limbs, long head. It's fully grown. It's towering over Brett. He turns around. This thing opens its mouth, revealing a second mouth, which kind of like, blah, like ejects out of it. It's if anybody who's seen Alien knows exactly what I'm talking about. Yes. It's, uh, yeah. It's iconic. <laughs> yeah. It jets from the, the creature's mouth, gets Brett in the head, and it drags him away, bloody and screaming into an air shaft. <laughs> it's never really made clear what he's doing with these people. I assume he's eating them. Uh, I hope not, but Jesus. Uh, you never see any bodies after this thing's done with them, <laughs> except towards the end when he's in a hurry. <laughs> so Ripley and Parker hear him and arrive just in time to see a g- glimpse of the monster as Brett disappears, blood drips down. So Parker and Ripley now know what they're in for. They know that this thing is big. It's in the air ducts. Brett's dead. Yes. So they debate their next move. They all agree this thing's using the air shaft to move around. So if we can get it out of the ducts into the airlock, they could probably blow it out of space. Ripley asks Ash if he can offer some helpful info as a scientist. Ash, Ash suggests the alien's probably afraid of fire, as most animals are. And uh, there are some flamethrowers on board. Ripley volunteers to monitor the or to go into the air shafts. Dallas overrules her by volunteering himself. Again, just not very good captaining. Like, they need you. You're the leader. You shouldn't be doing this. 
Yeah, yeah, he's he's acting like he's a wild card. Yeah, he is. It's weird. Yeah, and you're, uh, not, you're not Charlie Day, man. No, man. <laughs> Come on, you're Dennis. Wild card, bitches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's no breaks. There's no breaks. I love the second time he tries that, and they're like, "So you you fixed the brakes?" Like, "Oh yeah, of course I did. <laughs> not making that mistake again." <laughs> so good, beautiful. So Dallas goes into the uh, he's going to go into the vents, but first he starts he goes to the computer, mother, to evaluate their procedure to get rid of this thing, but mother will not answer due to a lack of input. He tries to get mother to offer suggestions again. The computer won't answer due to um, lack of available data, and Dallas just types in. What are my chances? And the computer says it cannot compute. Ooh. When the AI is against you, that's when you know you're fucked. I <laughs> uh, cannot compute. So Ripley and Ash prepare the main airlock for decompression. Parker and Lambert position themselves where they can measure movement inside the ducts. Main duct is open. Dallas enters the network of air shafts with a flamethrower. The crew can monitor the valves behind him and corner this thing. Lambert uses a motion tracker to get his location when suddenly another signal starts going off, crawling very quickly towards Dallas. <laughs> Assuming it's the alien, Dallas uses the flamethrower to make sure one of the ducks leading down is safe. He ascends a ladder, finds a puddle of slime on the floor. Lambert assures him the alien cannot be far. He uses the flamethrower around him to scare it out of hiding. He's disoriented in the cramped space starts to panic the other signal starts moving again and Lambert tries to get him to move he gets up another ladder turns around and the thing is right there shrieks at him and grabs him oh so so creepy yeah man oh that whole scene is so fucking tense it's awesome (laughs) it's epic oh my god so static and feedback interrupt the line silence dallas is dead parker puts dallas's flamethrower on the table and it's like, there wasn't any blood and there wasn't a body. We don't know what happened. The thing just dragged him away. <laughs> Lambert is close to a nervous breakdown. Ripley is trying to hide her apprehension. Now that, you know, Dallas is gone and Kane's dead, Ripley's in charge. And uh, she suggests that they continue with Dallas's plan, somehow try to blow this thing out the airlock. Lambert says this is crazy and suggests that they just abandon ship. They get in the shuttle and they fuck off. However, the shuttle cannot sustain four people. So Parker is like, no, we can't do that. We got to kill this thing, even if it means going back to the duct system and blowing the alien out of the airlock. But they have to refill the flamethrower. So Ripley once again tries to get information from Ash, but he says he's still analyzing. And she is like, you know, you are no fucking help. You're a terrible science officer. <laughs> <laughs> and they try to go to Mother for answers since she, you know, Ripley's now in charge. So she has access. And this is pretty interesting. I love this scene. Ripley accesses the mother console, asks mother for answers as to why they are unable to neutralize the alien. The mother says she can't clarify. Ripley asks why. Mother says that she can't say why, referring to Special Order 937, which is only meant to be read by the science officer. Ripley uses a command to override that, and mother displays the following text. Nostromo rerouted to new coordinates. Investigate life form. Gather specimen, priority one, ensure return of organism for analysis, all other considerations secondary, crew expendable. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, expendable. <laughs> this was the true mission. The company knew about the alien and it sent the Nostromo to get it. <laughs> and as she's looking at this, suddenly Ash is right next to her saying there's an explanation for this. She is unbelievably pissed off. She grabs and shouts at him. She's sobbing. She leaves the console to get Parker and Lambert and tell them, but finds that Ash is closing all the doors, leaving the mess hall, preventing her from getting out of there. She demands that he open the doors. Ash simply stares at her. She notices that a drop of white liquid is running down his face, and he starts to have facial twitches. Weird. She's unnerved. She tries to run. He grabs her hair. She breaks free, but he rips some of her hair out. She tries to run. Ash catches up with her and throws her against the wall with very little effort. (laughs) When she's barely conscious, he tries to suffocate her by shoving a magazine into her mouth. (laughs) It's so brutal. 
Like something uh, Jason Bourne would do. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, some primal shit. Yeah, and she's trying to break free as Ash, you know, Ash is trying to, you know, he's making weird noises. Parker and Lambert show up. They drag Ash away from Ripley. And uh, Ash grabs a piece. He grabs Parker, and Parker starts groaning in pain. It's weird. Ash is suddenly super strong. Parker grabs a fire extinguisher, hits Ash with it in the back. Ash starts to convulse and shriek violently while spitting out this white liquid. Kind of looks like milk. Parker hits him again, and Ash's head comes off. (laughs) His body starts gushing this white liquid, and they realize that Ash is a fucking robot. (laughs) Shocker. Big shocker, especially the first time you see this, because you were like, what the hell is going on? This is... Yeah, this is like a uh, yeah monumental twist. Uh, oh, yes. And the and then yeah, you're kind of like you said, you're kind of like waiting to watch him how he acts the second time you watch it uh, with the whole new lens. Oh, for sure. Uh, Lambert gets gets him with the cattle prod, electric prod, and screams as she stabs Ash in the back with it, killing Ash. Ash is not disabled. Ripley tells Parker and Lambert what she read. The company sent him along to bring the alien back for the weapons division. Comment, you know, Ash was always protective of the creature, and they reconnect his head to see if he can tell them what to do or, you know, shine some light. And that's such a neat little scene because it's, I mean, the camera work, you can tell when it's a fake head and when it's Ian Holm, but it's still, the way it's done is is really good. And uh, (laughs) Ash confirms that his order was to bring back the life form, even if it meant sacrificing the crew. Ripley asks how they can kill this thing. Ash says, I won't lie about your chances. <laughs> God. Oh. So thanks. Thanks, fucking Bilbo. <laughs> so when he mocks them, Ripley just kicks his head, deconnects him, disconnects him. And Parker blows him apart with a flamethrower. So now that there's three of them, they decide. We're going to get the hell out of here. We're going to set the Nostromo to self-destruct, escape in the shuttle, leaving the alien to die. As they leave the room, Parker, yeah, he blows up Ash. Ripley's going to prepare the shuttle. Parker and Lambert are going to go grab, get coolant for the shuttle's life support systems. While prepping the shuttle, Ripley hears Jones, the cat, meowing, gets the cat, puts her in a, in a box, which is good. I'm glad she saved the cat. I like cats. <laughs> <laughs> Kill whoever you want in this movie, but make sure that cat survives. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> uh, Lambert and Parker are in the hold gathering equipment, and uh, suddenly the alien jumps out, takes out Lambert and Parker. It's it's pretty freaky. Ripley tries to go to help them. She's too late, and they're just ripped apart on the floor. Now she's alone. <laughs> Eesh. Creepy. Uh... In a deleted scene also that was in the director's cut, Ripley stumbles upon Dallas being turned into an egg. Oh, why is that not in there? I don't know. It's so grisly. He's still alive. Oh, He's dude, being turned that into an egg. Great. He just tells her, kill me. <laughs> it Jeez. is fuck, it's brutal. Eesh. And uh, yeah, that's not in the movie. I guess because it would contradict later on the franchise because like, you know, in Aliens, the queen is the one who lays the eggs. Uh, yeah, yeah. I get why that's not here, but <laughs> it's a tough scene to watch. <laughs> so Ripley is in shock. She she put the she had already put the cat in the shuttle, so that's good. And uh, she runs to the emergency room without stopping. She is now like, I gotta get the fuck out of here. I'm next. So she gets to the self destruct. She completes the se- the sequence. And Mother announces that the self-destruct has been activated. The ship's going to detonate in 10 minutes. However, the self-destruct can be canceled during the first five minutes, just, you know, in case. And uh, this is when she finds Dallas being turned into an egg. Ugh. Oh, no, wait. Dallas is stuck to the wall. Brett is being turned into an egg. Bastard. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And she does kill him. She burns them both with the flamethrower. Ripley then crawls up a ladder. It's a rough day for Ripley. Ripley yeah, up. no kidding. You know, we we recently talked about a training day. This sounds like a rougher. <laughs> this sounds like a little bit rougher day. God damn. I would love to see Alonzo take on that alien. He wouldn't take any shit from anybody. 
Uh, you motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if he could look at that thing and be like, King Kong ain't got shit on me. He, that alien would be like, I don't care about King Kong. And he'd be screaming at the alien, I got acid blood. What do you <laughs> got? I got acid blood. He'd be freaking out. Oh, man. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Fuck. Oh, I love it. Man. So, Ripley is, uh, she's trying to retrace her steps, make sure that she could, you know, gets back in time. And the alien comes into view around the corner. It wants the cat. It's hungry. <laughs> Ripley races back to the self-destruct mechanism, tries to override the procedure. However, she's too late. The mechanism's already starting to activate. She restarts the cooling unit, but she can't stop the countdown. She's got five minutes to get out of there or the ship's going to explode. So Ripley runs to the shuttle, tries to fight off the alien, getting, gets into the lifeboat. The, it, the alien's nowhere to be seen. She gets the, She finds the cat container. Jones is alive. The fires start to erupt across the ship. She picks up Jones, boards the shuttle. She has a minute to abandon ship. She gets to the launch sequence, and she gets away in the shuttle with the last 30 seconds of the Nostromo's countdown. And when that ship explodes, it explodes. I mean, that is no like kidding. Three consecutive nuclear explosions. <laughs> I mean, Jesus. So Ripley's like, oh, thank God, it's over. She gives Jones a hug. She starts preparing a bi- uh, one of the beds for hypersleep. She puts Jones in it. She's uh she's stripping, about to get comfortable. She reaches t- towards an alcove, and this hand emerges from the wall. <laughs> The alien is on board with her. Whew. It's just kind of laying there, too. Oh, yeah, I know. It's like so chill, just relaxed. Like, hey, what's up? Yeah. Like, it's not <laughs> malicious. Like, it's not trying to. Like, it's not here for sport. It's like literally just trying to survive. It's fucked up. <laughs> so she gets into a locker with some spacesuits, notices the alien's not stopping her. Excuse me. She gets a, par- a harpoon gun, straps herself into a chair, and starts opening a series of air vents, trying to f- blast steam onto the alien to drive it out of its hiding spot. And then, as she's activating some buttons, she doesn't notice the monster is right next to her. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like it's oh, man. standing there with its mouth open, going to attack her. And panicked, she opens the blast door, and this thing gets sucked out the airlock. Everything that's not secured does. The alien gets to all the way to the to the door, and it's like holding itself in. It's not getting sucked out. So she fires the harpoon before the creature can get in. It gets, she gets it. It flies out of space, but it grabs the shuttle and starts climbing up the engine. So she hits the gas and blasts this thing apart. <laughs> it's awesome. So it's good. Ripley's alive with the cat. She, they yeah, had, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotta make sure the cat's okay. Two survivors. There are two survivors. She enters the hypersleep for the journey home, but before that, she records a final log entry saying that everyone is dead. The cargo and the ship were destroyed. She hopes to reach Earth in six weeks, be picked up by the company. She signs off Ripley, last survivor of the Nostromo. And that's Alien. <laughs> Hell yeah. Just Hell so of powerful. A movie. So powerful the whole way through. Oh, it's, it's so good. And uh, here are some film guys and facts for you. Number one, the blue laser lights that were used in the alien ship's egg chamber were borrowed from the Who. <laughs> How about that? The band was testing out the lasers for their stage show in the sound stage next door. <laughs> that is crazy. Ridley Scott just went next door and was like, hey, Roger Daltrey and Pete Townsend and Keith Moon and I forget the fourth guy. Can we, <laughs> can we borrow these lights? <laughs> John Entwistle. There we go. John. Oh, Entwistle. there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know my who. I saw them twice in Vegas. Fucking great show. Jeez, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, number two, the chest bursting scene was filmed in one take with four cameras. For the sequence, John Hurt stuck his head, shoulders, and arms through a hole in the mess table, linking up with a mechanical torso that was packed with compressed air and lots of animal guts. Man. <laughs> The rest of the cast were told were not told that real blood and guts were being used so as to provoke genuine reactions of shock and disgust. 
Apparently, this worked so well that Yafikado went home in complete shock afterwards, locking himself in a room and refusing to talk to his wife for several hours. <laughs> so Ridley Scott just told them something's going to happen and act scared. He didn't tell them what was going to happen. <laughs> and their shock is real in the movie. I love that. That is Oh, insane. that's incredible. What a the, touch. The balls to do that. And this was his second movie. Wow. That's incredible. Number three, H.R. Geiger's designs were changed several times because of their blatant sexuality, which surprises me considering how blatantly sexual the final product is. Like, what did they change? (laughs) (laughs) Good God. Uh, Number four, this movie was originally scripted to end with Ripley escaping the Nostromo on the shuttle, the alien dying on board the Nostromo. Ridley Scott thought this ending was way too simplistic, so he negotiated with the studio for an additional half a mil and a week of filming to add a fourth act to the movie, showing how the alien stowed away aboard the shuttle, with Ripley trying to flush it out. Scott originally wanted a much darker ending, where the alien climbs back into the shuttle, Ripley harpoons it, but it makes no difference, the alien runs towards her, slams through her masks, and rips her head off. It would then... Yeah. (laughs) It would then sit in her chair and start mimicking Dallas's voice, saying, quote, I'm signing off. Hopefully the network will pick me up. Weird. What in the hell? I, it I think it would have killed the whole movie if this thing could suddenly talk. Yeah, no thank you. No thank you. Apparently Fox wasn't too pleased with such a dark ending. And according to Scott, while pitching this idea over the phone, there was a long and uncomfortable silence. Oh, Lord. <laughs> The last thing you want to hear from the suits. <laughs> so within 14 hours of that phone call, a studio executive arrived who threatened to fire him on the spot unless he changed the ending to one where the alien would die. <laughs> Scott later admitted that allowing Ripley to live was the better ending. Yeah, I could. Yeah. yeah. But I love the suits were I, like, you are fucking gone unless you change this. <laughs> That's insane. This goes to show how important they valued this movie. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's taken care of so well. For sure. So let's give a brief history of the Alien franchise, beginning with the one that somehow managed to surpass the first film in some fans' eyes, myself included, 1986's Aliens, directed by James Cameron. Written and directed by James Cameron. Arguably the best in the franchise, Aliens picks up 57 years after the first film, with Ripley having survived the journey back to Earth in cryosleep. In this time, LV-426, the planet, has been colonized, and the colony has disappeared. Ripley is recruited along with a team of colonial marines to go to the planet and assess the situation. IMDb score 8.3, Rotten Tomatoes score 97%. Aliens is fucking awesome. Yeah, yeah. Easily, somehow, I didn't think it was possible, but this movie surpasses the first film. It's definitely my favorite. <laughs> it's so yeah, bad. I don't know if I have a favorite. I, I see them, as of right now, I see them on equal pl- equal playing field, but uh, I definitely am due for a rewatch of that one as well. I was, um, Aliens was one of the first movie parties I did at the Draft House. Oh, that's awesome. They had live pyrotechnics. They had fire shooting out of the screen. Probably not a good idea, because, you know, well, we know why. But, um... Yeah, I they, I went in. They started accidentally playing Alien, <laughs> and uh, all the all the people in the audience were like, "Woo, double feature, double feature!" Like everyone was freaking out. But they we got a good twenty minutes into Alien before they fixed it. <laughs> oh my gosh! And so at that point, I was like, "Just let us watch Alien too." But uh, yeah, that was fun. Aliens is a masterpiece. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Then there was 1992's Alien 3, or Alien Cubed, however you want to say it, directed by and disowned by David Fincher. (laughs) Yes. It was his first movie. Ripley crash lands on a prison planet with an alien stowaway and must rally the prisoners to find and kill it. IMDb score 6.5, Rotten Tomatoes 43%. Pretty substantial drop. (laughs) Yeah, major drop. Drop in quality, drop in score. Alien 3 is a boring movie. Yes. Then there was 1997's Alien Resurrection, which follows a super-powered alien-human hybrid clone of Ripley 200 years later, 
who works with a team of space pirates to escape an alien infested ship before it gets to Earth. IMDb score 6.2, Rotten Tomatoes 55%. That one is just weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It, from what I remember, I've, uh, I've only seen the, the third and fourth one uh, one time. Resurrection has such an incredible cast that it's really kind of nuts that this movie failed so badly. I mean, Ron Perlman is in it, Michael Wincott, Dan Hedaya, Brad Dourif, Winona Ryder. Like, this movie should have worked. Written by Joss Whedon. Like, this thing... Yeah. It's just weird. Then the spinoffs began in 2004 with the divisive Alien vs. Predator, where the alien faces off against his logical adversary, the equally iconic Predator, in an underground Arctic pyramid recently discovered by a team of scientists. IMDb 5.6, Rotten Tomatoes 21%. How do you screw this up? PG-13 rating, among other things. Uh, yeah, this is, that is one of the ultimate, uh, what the hell are you thinking? Like, what are you doing? How, how do you fuck it up? Yeah, it's one of the ultimate, yeah, come on, you know? How do you mess that up for the fans? Admittedly, I do like the first Alien vs. Predator. It's it's not bad. It's just, when you have two R-rated franchises, why in the hell would you make the meetup film PG-13? <laughs> That's such yeah, a fuck. No sense. Who are you? Yeah, who is this for? Yeah. And then that was followed by 2007's Aliens vs. Predator Requiem, the most reviled film in either franchise. It picks up at the end of AVP, where a recently birthed Pred alien crashes a Predator ship in a small mountain town, freeing a number of facehuggers that infect the town. Sounds like a neat concept. Horribly executed. IMDb score 4.7. Rotten Tomatoes score 12%. And it destroyed the careers of the filmmakers, the Brothers Strauss. Yeah. <laughs> jokesters that movie's so bad we're gonna do episodes on every one of these movies eventually <laughs> so after that fiasco there was a long hiatus until 2012 when ridley scott announced a prequel to the alien franchise in prometheus a team of astronauts and scientists trace mankind's origins to an alien planet where they find an infectious virus and the giant humanoid aliens who created it it's very much its own standalone story, but it does have a number of connections to the franchise. IMDb score 7.0, Rotten Tomatoes 73%. Uh, Prometheus is just so weird that it's really hard to get into. And everyone in that movie is a fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah, that was what I didn't like was uh, the characters were forgettable. And yeah, I, I didn't I, I just don't remember being very impressed by it. But yeah, I'm going to rewatch all these eventually just to just to go down that path. Why not? Well, the scientists in that movie are like, they're walking around without their helmets on. They're, they see these like alien, alien snake, and they're like, come on, come here, like they're petting it. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, weird. Ugh. Finally, as of 2020, the last film in the franchise is 2017's Alien Covenant, a direct follow-up to Prometheus, where a colony ship intercepts a signal from an Earth-like planet, lands on it and finds the sinister robot David who has created the alien, which later in the franchise would be known as the Xenomorph. And uh, that has an IMDb score of 6.4, Rotten Tomato score 66%. It was okay. It's really forgettable. Yeah, agreed. And uh, since the purchase of 20th Century Fox by Disney, the future of the Alien franchise is very much in doubt. The planned sequel to Covenant, titled Alien Awakening, is on indefinite hold and will likely never happen. Which is a shame, but at the same time, I mean, we, it's had a good run, and it's got really two great films, and you know, that's all it'll ever have. Yeah, likely. That's it, yeah. I give Alien a 9. It's a brilliant atmospheric horror film that brought something new to the table in the most horrific way. Yeah, I give it a 9 as well. It's uh, close to a 10. I don't quite know what's holding it back, but... Aliens. Um, that's what's holding it back. <laughs> I gave that one a 10 straight up. Oh, you get Aliens a ten, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the difference between those, yeah. Yeah, I'd probably give them both a nine. I just, um, like you said, the atmosphere is uh, uh, damn near unmatched. It is uh, amazing stuff, and uh, the you know the acting's awesome, and that's a big thing for me. And when you combine well done, you know, horror and sci-fi with the good acting, it's a treat. Oh, for sure, man. So, what do we got for Friday? Friday, we'll stay in the uh, Ridley Scott uh, realm, correct? And we're going to go with uh, Blade Runner, 1982. 
We're going to do Blade Runner, the final cut for you sticklers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Blade Runner is uh, obviously a legendary story. You know, Philip K. Dick, source material, uh, just a genius mind, great sci-fi writer. Uh, Blade, War- Blade Runner 2049 came out, you know, three years ago now. Um, yeah, this this is going to be a fun one to go back and do. Uh, I don't remember liking it too fondly the last time I watched it, Blade Runner, but I'm excited to go back and see it again, give it another chance. Fair warning, I've seen this movie three times, and I just can't get into it. So I'm hoping, like you, that this time I find something new to like about it. But we're, we're going into it already not really fans, which is yeah, interesting. No, yeah, we're, we're, we're both going into it uh, open-minded, but also... <laughs> With that in the back of our heads that we both know we, we haven't quite enjoyed it like everybody else. Yeah. But, you know, maybe this, you know, I've, I've been surprised on this show before. I watched movies I thought were going to suck or I thought it sucked before and then they ended up being great. So who yes. knows? Yes. Yeah, I agree. Maybe this will finally be when Blade Runner gets me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's take a look at what happened this week in film. Let's do it. Beginning on a sad note, veteran character actor Brian Dennehy has died at age 81 from natural causes. Denny, he was known for his brash and boisterous characters, including his performances in First Blood, Presumed Innocent, and recent filmgasm episode, Tommy Boy. He will be missed. Yes, so sad. Oh, yeah. Denny, he was, was fucking awesome. He all, he brought it every time. And he was a Tony Award winner. He was a Golden Globe winner. The guy just was a rock star, very respected in the industry, and it was just, just a shock. Yeah, I'm going to need you, Tommy Boy, to get this uh, party started. Big time, man. Uh I feel, I feel like I'm at that funeral. Yeah. Why Sad. say no when it's so easy to say yes? You know, I can get a good look at a T-bone steak by sticking my head up a bull's ass, but I'd rather take the butcher's word for it. <laughs> Boy, would I like to get some of that. <laughs> you got an edible on that thing? <laughs> oh, Tommy boy. Eight, like, what was it? Five whiskey sours and I still sell the son of a bitch? Damn, I'm good. <laughs> Damn, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so great. Yeah. Rest in peace, Brian Denny. You'll never yeah, yeah. be forgotten. Uh, there's a new Green Hornet movie in development at Universal, currently titled Green Hornet and Cato. The 2011 attempt at rebooting the Green Hornet, starring Seth Rogen, Jay Chow, and Christoph Waltz, was a massive bomb. I'm here's hoping they can do better. <laughs> I saw that in theaters. I, I still don't know why. Me too. <laughs> it's such a strange movie. Like, was I that bored? <laughs> you know what? I saw it because I was such a big fan of Christoph Waltz. That's why I saw it. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I won't lie. I mean, I you know, I, I love Seth Rogen. I, at least um, his there was a time, you know, the Judd Apatow stuff. Uh, he was great. Yes, he was. It's such a such a weak movie, man. Ugh. Next up, the trailer for the film Capone debuted, starring Tom Hardy as an old, decrepit, syphilis-riddled Al Capone near the end of his life. Uh, looks like it could go either way, but I'm a huge Tom Hardy fan, so I'm on board. It's being helmed by Josh Trank, so big red flag there. Uh, but here's hoping, man. I mean, it looks good. Yeah, yeah, I think it'll be fine, and I think I think Hardy will do a good job. I don't know if it'll be like a great movie, but you know, he'll 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 do a good job. I hope so. Finally, and this comes as no surprise, San Diego Comic Con 2020 has been canceled due to coronavirus concerns, with plans to hold it in July of 2021. It's the first time Comic-Con has been canceled in its 50-year history. Craziness. And it's looking like uh, AMC Theaters is going to go bankrupt. So I think they're closing down. Yeah, it's, that's going to that's gonna keep happening, stuff like that. I really hope that the movie theater does not – we've talked about this before, but I do not want coronavirus to kill the movie theater industry. I That'll break my heart. I, I, I couldn't imagine – that being taken away from my life forever. If it does go away, we should we should open a, like an indie film, th- like an indie movie theater. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> we'll just yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, that's yeah. It's sort of like a really dark thought, but you know, it it can happen. It can happen. It's a possibility. <sighs> so we, uh. yeah, we just we just all again, you know, you hear this on every podcast, maybe on TV and radio show. We just keep doing your part, you know. Stay inside when you can and, you know, uh, stay positive. It's uncertain times and everything is new and it's a dark time for everybody, including the entertainment industry. So, you know, like Austin said, just do your part and I would say, you know, try to remain optimistic. Yeah. Yes, definitely. It's difficult to do that, but, you know, try. Try your best. Yeah. 
Well, that is all for today, folks. Check out Blade Runner on Friday, and we'll have another special bonus episode for you on Sunday. Next week, we're discussing the 2010 psychological thriller Shutter Island, directed by Martin Scorsese and starring Leonardo DiCaprio, Mark Ruffalo, Ben Kingsley, Max von Sydow, and a host of other great character actors. A U.S. marshal investigates the disappearance of a murderer who escaped a mental asylum and dives deep down the rabbit hole, leading to an unexpected twist that divided audiences. Sure to be a great episode. Can't wait for next week. Remember, in space, no one can hear you scream. So don't stick your head in any strange alien eggs. Peace.